I think we just gotta wait just a minute. We are live, I think. Live. Yeah, I can see that in the corner. Yeah. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, guys. So looks like we're live here. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the latest Ultralytics live session. So I'm Glenn Jocker. I'm your host, and we are here with Adrian. And I apologize because I'm probably going to butcher your last name here. Adrian Bugazweski. <laughs> Is that close? Or... <laughs> yeah, it, it could be. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> okay, great. So Adrian is joining us from Intel. And uh, we've been collaborating closely over the last few months on a tighter integration between our Ultralytics YOLO models and Intel's export framework, which is called OpenVINO. So Adrian, uh, let's see here. So you are a software evangelist at Intel. You graduated from Danx University of Technology and Computer Science about seven years ago and you've been in computer science and deep learning ever since then. So now you're a team leader of data scientists and Android developers uh, previously for two years, and you're responsible for applications who take professional photos, like for ID cards and passports from the house. So I guess that was pretty popular during coronavirus days. And now you're also the author of, uh, the co-author of landcover.ai dataset. So this is also a, uh, a cool data set. Let's see here, and creator of the OpenCV Image Viewer plugin, and a deep learning lecturer occasionally. This is a pretty deep roster of accomplishments there. <laughs> and uh, so, at your current role, though, you're <laughs> Thanks, Intel, bud. and you love educating people on OpenVINO toolkit. So, I think uh, that's it's great because I think it's a tremendous software package, and I think not a lot of people know about it. So, uh, hopefully, here we can kind of educate people a little more. So. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Intel OpenVINO and uh, the background there? Sure, then thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's start with what, what OpenVINO is, right? Uh, so I have I have prepared a few slides about that. So uh, let me awesome, share okay. my screen right now. And so mm -hmm. I will present using some diagrams, images, and so on, so it it's easier to understand. So okay, yeah. let's look at the presentation and yeah, it's Pretty here. Nice. So okay. uh, today we would like to talk about OpenVINO and Ultralytics integration. So just a quick overview on OpenVINO. So what OpenVINO is, OpenVINO is an open source toolkit for optimizing and deploying AI inference. And OpenVINO started as a um, tool for visual inference only but it's not anymore. For now, it's for all kinds of AI applications like Gen AI, for example, neural, uh, natural language processing, large language models, audio processing, and everything like that. So uh, it's to general use. And of course, OpenVINO is open source, so it's uh, available on our GitHub, and so you can download it as pip package, for example. And if you use one of these frameworks to train your model, for example, PyTorch as YOLO here, V8, uh, TensorFlow, but also Keras, TensorFlow Lite, ONNX, and, and so on, then you can convert your model to OpenVINO format and use OpenVINO runtime to run on Intel's hardware, like CPUs, for example, Xeon CPUs, uh, which is server CPU, also core CPUs, which are in your laptop, PCs, and so on but also GPUs and recently released Intel discrete GPU cards, as well as integrated ones in your CPU. And starting right. with uh, last, uh, yes, Glenn? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of logos here on the screen. I was going to ask you. So, so on the tarp, these are all the training frameworks that we're familiar with. And so this arrow that That's connects the frameworks with OpenVINO, is that all done with the same Python package, just the OpenVINO PIP package? That's correct. The only one package is enough to convert any of these formats to OpenVINO. Hmm. Okay, really interesting. And then it looks like there's a, a number of GPU offerings here. So, so these are relatively new, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think most people are familiar with Intel CPUs, eh, but not so much the GPUs. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, CPUs are well known. So 
if you know our mobile CPUs, for example, probably you know that we have their integrated GPU. So that's why you can connect your, um, that you, uh, that's how you can display anything on your laptop monitor, or that that's why you uh, can uh, connect a, a, an external monitor to your PC without having any discrete mm -hmm. GPU card, because there is already integrated GPU like Intel, for example, Iris or uh, new Arc series. But also we have discrete cards. Arc is for uh, PCs, your PCs, and um, Flex. This is the series for uh, servers. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, let's see, NPUs and FPGAs. Are those mostly yes. for embedded yeah. applications? So NPUs are specific hardware, a new one. We just released that in December, 2023. So it's 44 mm -hmm. months ago. And NPUs is neural processing unit, and it's used for a long background task, which can run on your computer. Don't using uh, your CPU. So don't use any, um, you know, there is no heavy load on your CPU. CPU is still free. So you can use for anything else and NPU is used instead for uh, that um, background task and of course it's low power so device so it uses less battery than cpu for example so it's good for uh, as i said bank background long tasks like blur uh, your background or detect people in the you know in the yeah, some right service now. something <laughs> like that yeah yeah so if i had so if i had an intel chip in my computer i could be doing this right now since my background is blurred yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. If you have Intel new Intercore Ultra, so Car Ultra yeah. is um, required in this case because NPU is included there. Okay, got it. And of course, yeah. if we use OpenVINO, it can run on any operating system, right, Glenn? So Mac, Linux, or Windows. I, I hope you tried already. Yeah, I have. Um, actually, as part of the Ultralytics CI, we run benchmarks on Linux and Mac OS. Uh, Windows, we we have that available, but we don't have it turned on. But uh, we probably should. Okay. I'm not sure why that's not there. So. But it works, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I trust you. <laughs> if not, I know where to find you, so. <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. So yeah. this was, uh, you know, just overview at all, high level. I don't know, high level architecture of OpenVINO, something like that. Uh, so to use OpenVINO, we need to convert our model first. And why I mentioned it here, because this is already done in Ultralytics package. So if you look at these lines of, of code, um, the model conversion API, the function convert model and everything like that, it's done for you in Ultralytics package, right, Glenn? Is it there, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we try to make things as simple as possible. So in the Ultralytics package, you just be model that export format equals OpenVINO. Yeah, so if we export it, you don't have to do it yourself. You just need to use export function from um, Ultralytics package. So when we convert our model to our format, IR, intermediate representation, if this is a long term, then we can use it with our runtime, OpenVINO runtime for faster processing, faster inference, um, faster prediction. And we need just a few lines of code um, to load our image to, of course, first to import OpenVINO, then to load our image, um, and initialize core, so initializing OpenVINO the same, then read our model, compile model for some specific device and run the inference. But it's also already done in Ultralytics package, so you don't have to you do it yourself. It's already there. You just need to use OpenVINO format, OpenVINO model, and the, these this uh, backend will be used. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If you uh, if you export a model to OpenVINO, then you can load it just like you would a PyTorch model. So you just call the YOLO class, but you pass it the OpenVINO directory or the XML file itself, both of those will work. And then it'll recognize it's an OpenVINO model and it'll pass it to the appropriate code, which is uh, a lot of what we see here, plus some extra stuff. <laughs> yes, and this integration already happened in past, right, Graham? So now we should mm -hmm. focus 
what we already de delivered in last few weeks. And the first thing we did uh, in our last collaboration was uh, a throughput mode. And I'm going to mm -hmm. explain what throughput in this case is. So if we look at, um, if we think about applications, there are, through, there are two modes. First one is latency mode. So we would like to have the uh, output as soon as possible. So we have, for example, a web stream, um, a camera, camera stream with some uh, images, and you, we would like to get results um, uh, just we finished processing um, the, the previous one, the previous frame, and then again, again, and then again. So in this case, we will use latency mode. And how to do it? We just need to add this to our uh, compile function, uh, compile model function. So there is additional additional configuration and performance hint must equals latency. So this is the first case that we would like to have our results as soon as possible. There is also the second case when we would like to have high throughputs. So we would like to have as many frames as possible. So we don't care about latency. They can be delayed a little bit, but we would like to have many, many frames per second uh, because we would like to use many processing units in our uh, hardware, for example. How to achieve that? Uh, the same. We just need to uh, change our compile model function and we need to add additional configuration performance hint equals throughput. But there is one more mode. We call it cumulative throughput. And it means that it will uh, use multiple devices because latency and throughput just use one device. So CPU or GPU. But if we use cumulative throughput, we will use all devices we have, CPUs, GPUs, NPUs, all of them. So this is really cool. And we, of course, use it like before. So we just add additional configuration to compile model function, which now equals cumulative throughput. And this is something what we already implemented in Ultralytics. Glenn, could you tell us more how to use it in Ultralytics, YOLO V8? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, just, I was looking at this and it's very impressive because all of the complication of where to send individual images is handled by the open Vino package, which is really nice. And uh, it really aligns with, I think, what we want to do at Ultralytics, which is take the complicated stuff and kind of put it in a way that it's automatically handled for the optimum performance. So um, we've been working on, uh, on updates to the Ultralytics package to accommodate these uh, throughput modes and latency modes. And uh, the funny thing is we, we got this integrated a few weeks ago. And, uh, and then I realized that this wasn't going to work because the Ultralytics package itself wasn't ready for batched predictions uh, for some data loaders. And so, so we got the open Vino side done. And uh, then I realized we had to go back to the drawing board on the predictor. And so we did structural changes in the Ultralytics package itself. And now it's fully batched inference capable. So now when you use predict mode, regardless of what type of media you pass it, whether it's like a YouTube video or streaming source uh, or a collection of images or videos, you can specify a batch size. So, so maybe you guys didn't know this, but up until like a week ago, this just didn't exist in, in YOLO v5 or YOLO v8. If you wanted batched inference on the prediction side, we just, we didn't have it. Uh, we, we hadn't prioritized it. Uh, and I'm not sure why, <laughs> to be honest. But so we, we sat down and we got it done. And uh, coupled with the open Vino cumulative throughput mode, now it's, it's seamlessly integrated. And so to access latency mode, you don't do anything. You just run inference normally at batch size one. And this will return an image, uh, the first image, as fast as possible. But if you have a lot of images, let's say you have uh, like a directory with a bunch of pictures and videos, your summer vacation, you want to run inference on it. Then you want cumulative throughput mode. It's not going to get you the first image back the fastest, but it's going to get you the last image back the fastest. And that's going to make a big difference, especially if there's a lot of pictures. And so to access that, you just specify a batch size. So you could say batch eight, and now this will run your YouTube video or group of, uh, group of uh, images and videos at batch size eight for all the different media that you have, whether it's uh, images, videos, or streaming sources. And so if you just uh, just use batch one, latency mode, batch 
two or higher, you'll go into cumulative throughput mode. Uh, and then the maximum batch size is really not dictated by us, but it's dictated by your hardware. So you can really experiment and see how high you can go there. Um, there's probably a sweet spot is I think if you increase the batch size long enough, then the data loading itself may start to become a bottleneck. So, so yeah, so that's it. Uh, if you have an open Vino model, you just specify a higher batch size and it's going to automatically put you into cumulative throughput mode. And you should be able to see that then in the inference speed results. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's uh, exactly what we wanted to achieve, right? To have higher throughput uh, running YOLO V8. So if we look at code, um, to use cumulative throughput, it would be something like here. We need to uh, use cumulative throughput mode in our compile model function. Uh, it's also good to de define a device name equals auto. It mean, auto means that the device will be selected automatically, the best device. And of course, it, it's worth to also add async mode. And you know what's nice? You don't have to do it yourself. We already implemented them, that in uh, Authorlytics package. So as Glenn said, you just need to increase your batch size and it will use cumulative throughput mode automatically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like the other part is okay. it's, it's also dynamic. So you can export the model at, uh, at any batch size or image size you want. And then when you run it on inference, that part didn't matter anymore because it's going to scale up and down just like a PyTorch model. So it's super flexible in both the batch dimension, but also the image dimensions. So it's really cool. Uh, it's super performant. It's really seamlessly integrated. And it's kind of hard to break it because no matter what settings you put in, it should still work really well. Yeah. Um, so Glenn, I think it's time to run our first benchmarks to show some live demo. So I will show so live how demo? To Okay, all right. That's always exciting. Yeah. The users are going to like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm yeah. going to change my um, screen sharing. <laughs> I, I will screen share my um command yeah. line uh okay i am sharing it right now i hope you can see it in a moment and it's there yeah, Good. It's perfect okay, okay. So yeah, so I, see terminal. I prepared yeah. um some a virtual environment with ultralytics package installed there and um this is my server right so i'm gonna show you what um devices i have there first so i have mm -hmm. intel xeon gold uh 6348 it's intel third generation of xeon and I also have their um, XPU. Let me run the command. So uh, I have also their GPU Flex 170. So I have their two devices, CPU and GPU. And I will use all of them when running cumulative throughput mode. So let's start maybe with some simple, simple prediction, right? So let's... Um, ah. Mm, yeah, so let's run first um, the prediction with, um, um, okay, so let me list the, the directory. I have there um, a video called Coca Walking in Berkeley. Um, so I will use that video to, this is a simple video. I will use that video. Did you shoot this video yourself or you get it from the internet? Let's see, Adrian. Hmm, Adrian looks like he might be frozen. Okay. Well, okay, it looks like Adrian is frozen for me right when he's about to run this video. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Back. okay. Yeah, it's here. Okay, so let's run the inference when we have our um, PyTorch model. Mm -hmm. And so let's let's wait for the results. Okay, it's running one by one. It's detected. Uh, the dog is detected there. That's true. There is dog. Coco is a dog walking in Berkeley, and we can see that our inference time is twenty one millisecond per one image for the size of three hundred eighty four by three hundred eighty four. So what we need to do first, we of course need to convert a uh, yellow model to OpenVINO format. So I am. Mm, doing it right now using YOLO export uh, command. So I would like to use the same model, of course, YOLO uh, V8N model, and I am converting into OpenVINO. 
Uh, the model is converted, so it should be in YOLO V8 and OpenVINO model directory, and I'm gonna use it uh, right now. So let's run it yeah, first yeah. without any um, without any batch. So uh, this will be latency mode, right? So let's run latency mode. Uh, you remember 21 milliseconds per uh, PyTorch inference before, That's and right, now we perfect. are running once again, and oh, it must be oh. faster. Oh my God. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a bit faster. 4.8 Four, <laughs> 4. milliseconds inference. Oh, I am not sure if we can wait, even wait, wait, break Adrian, that record. Why, why is it so much faster? It's a lot faster. <laughs> the, this model is already very nice, uh, nicely optimized yeah. for our this, hardware, this just, right? It's so, just running. Where, where did this model just run? On the CPU or, or that GPU that you had attached or where? Uh, okay, so this model uses, um, as you remember, we used auto device in the code. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. this case, it probably selected GPU. That's why it's okay. so fast, right? Okay. Uh, but that's good. We have GPU there. And let's change good. one more thing. <laughs> let's try to use throughput mode, right? So let's use our batch size higher than one. And of course, mm -hmm. I tested it a few times. So I know that the batch size here is uh, the um, the biggest possible so we have 20 288 that all the, that's all the yeah, frames two, in the video <laughs> exactly so we will run them at once and let's see uh, at the results yeah. i tested it a few days it's back a, so it was it was nice it's a fairly large batch I, let's see here let's see if, if i hadn't works. done this before i'd be a little worried right now ah uh, you can see that using oh uh, 5.5 uh, 5. Oh, 5. okay, okay. It's a little bit slower um, because I don't know why the, the first inference was so fast. When I tested it, it was slower than this um, time. But what we can see here that we already used um, that bar size, right? 288 uh, images. This is pretty crazy. I don't, uh, I don't know you actually run an image in just a single batch. I've never seen that before. <laughs> uh, I think we, I know what happened. Look at this. We yeah. used a different size, 640 by 640. Ah, but both. Yeah, of them I saw that. I saw that the first time. Um, why is that? That's because. Oh, oh no! I know Let's why run it is, again. Okay, so it's because no, no. This makes sense actually. So the PyTorch models, um, they will adapt to rectangular inference for like the minimum image size in the batch. But the exported mm -hmm. models, I think they're defaulted to square inference. Yeah, but we are comparing both OpenVINO models, right? So we yeah. are comparing latency yeah, then, then it mode be an and throughput mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I don't know what happened because last time I ran it, so latency was slower than throughput in case of, well, of course, inference time. time. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, let, let's try once again, right? So we will yeah. see if we are um, so fast again. 4.1. Okay. 4.1. 4 <laughs> I don't know what happened then. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, and then Good. let's try it again with, with the batch size. Uh, yeah, let's let's run one once again with batch size. Um, by the way, there's to, uh, uh, for the users, there's a line here that tells you the mode that it's in. So it should say... Yeah. There it is. Yeah, open it's the using cumulative, cumulative throughput. We can see it right now he, uh, here. Oh, but that's interesting. So that's for batch size one inference. Maybe that's a bug I need to fix. Ah, uh, five point four. Once again, that that's surprise <laughs> for me. Um, uh, but okay, <laughs> that that's okay. Also, uh, I think you know this is specific. Um, um, let okay, let's do something like that. Let's try. Like, yeah, what if we try different batch size? Here? Okay, sixty four. Okay, sixty four. Let's try that one and see. <laughs> Maybe I selected the wrong size of batch, but. It worked well. But by the way, Adrian, it looks like there's a small bug I need to fix because it's saying for batch size equals one inference. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think that's yeah, just a reporting bug. But I should, I should probably open up a PR for that. Let's see, fifteen. Come on, yeah, what happened so here? Yeah. Uh, ah, okay, okay, gun. I think I have the not the latest version of Ultralytics package. That's why. Oh, wait, what, let's see here. Okay, maybe that's why it's saying batch size one. So if you do, mm -hmm. uh, I think Pro the latest probably. one's 33, 34, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah okay. that was 27. Oh, okay, maybe maybe this is why. So so for everybody, things change quickly around here. So uh, 
Yeah, she yeah. Always download the latest version. Let's see once again. Then we've the latest version right now. Oh, now okay. Now it's reporting the correct batch size, but I don't know what this. Yes, means. yes. Five point four. Oh, okay, 5 .4. so this yeah. is the final results. Five point four. Mm -hmm. Uh, still faster than PyTorch, a little bit slower than latency mode, which is um, a surprise for me right now, uh, but still a good result, right? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, these are both just way faster than PyTorch. It's kind of shocking. Exactly. That's what we faster, wanted to actually. achieve with OpenVINA, right? <laughs> good, Glenn. Yeah. I think and this was a nice um, <laughs> presentation really of uh, throughput mode. Wait. Wait, let, let me ask you yeah. a question about the GPUs because I'm sure I'm always interested in this. So the GPU that's on your Intel machine, is it is it like a PCIe device that plugs in? Uh it is, yes, this, correct. Okay. okay, cool, cool. That's interesting. So it's super so easy just... to connect to any computer, yes. And then there's no there's no additional drivers that are needed. You just install the open Vino package, and as long as the, the GPU is installed, it'll find it. Like there's no, no, no of open course Vino dash. You need GPU the drivers, yeah. Okay, but there's no, there's no different Python there's no packages drivers. needed, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's very simple because you are just using our dev packages uh, available in our repository. So if you use Ubuntu or Debian or anything like that, it's super easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay, it's really but, interesting. Uh, Glenn, uh, throughput yeah. mode is not only the thing we already implemented, right? There was one more thing we would like to share today. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. I um, so, my head, but let me take a look. Yeah, let me share my screen you again. We did our live demonstration and uh -huh. that's right. I think we wanted to talk a little bit about, okay, so no, we talked about NSC. Yeah. Quantization. Okay, your sleeve there, Adrian. <laughs> Quantization. This is the this oh, is yeah, something what we already implemented from NNCF package. So, uh, mm -hmm. guys, just a quick um, overview: what quantization theory, what quantization is. So, if we look at the signal which we have here, it's a continuous signal, right? So we can have value from one minus one to one, but it can be any value, right? Any means really any. But uh, so we have so many values that we need to use um, a float number for that. And float number needs four bytes to store the value. But what if we can use just one value, one bit, one byte for, for a value? Uh, we can do something like this. We can quantize the function. So it looks very mm, similar. Yeah. It, it's not the same, right? But probably it's very, very similar it's and may give a good result also so this is what is the um, theory behind quantization we are using just a few values from a discrete uh, discrete values from a fixed set let's say here from minus one to one uh, with with a step of 0 0.25 uh, and then we just need to save 11 different values so for 11 values we just need four bits right so the mm -hmm. same happens in quantization. Of course, in quantization, we use one byte, so we have 256 different values. And if you look at uh, floating point 32 and the range of the 10 to 8, yeah, uh, yeah we, we are trying to do the quantization here. So it looks like this. We just uh, clip outliers and we round our numbers in floating point precision of course to the uh, formula in the bottom uh, so this is a simple um, overview of quantization and we use that quantization in our NNCF package to quantize our model it means that we are quantizing all weights we have inside so they are uh, right now first they are um, in end a precision so one value requires just one byte instead of four so the model size is four times uh, smaller. This is first. And the second, right. yeah. the, infer the inference time is also faster because we are using CPU dedicated hardware for integer operations, uh, like addition, multiplication, everything like that, instead of coprocessor for floating point. 
and that, that's why it works faster. So CPU um, hardware is just natively optimized for integer exactly. precision operations. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Yes. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why we can, and this is faster, right? Um, adding two integers are uh, the algorithm is much simpler, <laughs> yeah, much faster than that faster. doing that with yeah. floating points, right? When we have exponential, mantisa, everything like that, and we we deal with, we so, have to deal Adrian, with. Adrian, let me ask you a stupid question. So yeah. So when I when I first started doing Yolo v five, I started saving the checkpoints in FP sixteen because I realized they were much smaller instead of FP thirty two, and the numbers yes. were almost the same. Um, but then I realized like PyTorch itself doesn't allow you to run inference on FP16 weights. You can store them, which is nice because they take up half the space. But if you try and predict with that model, you'll get some errors on the PyTorch side. Uh, it, it only lets you do that on GPU. So, so you said CPUs are optimized for integer operations. So if I could, right. I guess I never did this experiment, but if we, if we integrated down to a date, then do you think PyTorch would allow you to run inference on that model? So I don't know about uh, PyTorch much, about inference in PyTorch, but I can yeah. promise you that if we use floating point 16 <laughs> or end 8 or floating point 32 in OpenVINO, open it will media, work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, on, on okay. any hardware, because you know when so, we quantize those models, uh, yeah. we use some kind of flexible architecture. So we are able to mm -hmm. dequantize them back to floating point. We are able to quantize mm -hmm. it further or anything like that. Uh, it's quite advanced topic, but we uh, that's how uh, it works to be flexible for any device. Okay, yeah, I got it. And, and I've seen even lower quantizations. It's it's really interesting. I think uh, oh, yeah. a paper even came out claiming that LLMs are 1.58 bits. They got to that number through like a weird kind of like cube root or something. But yeah, but so, yeah. I, I saw but that. But obviously, paper, the, yeah. the more you quantize, at some point, you're going to start losing enough precision that the I guess the accuracy drop off isn't worth the speed benefits, but but I think in date is uh, is a really nice trade off there because you can retain uh, yeah, most of the accuracy, say, but you're much faster. Th this is a sweet spot, uh, you know, accuracy yeah. versus performance. Of course, in OpenVINO we also support in four, and we use in four mm -hmm. for language models, for example, because they oh, are goodness. really huge, right? And it works yeah. well. Uh, but in eight is a sweet spot, I would say that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So let's look how to use quantization in NLCF package and then how we did it in Alteralytics package with uh, help of NLCF. So um, what we are doing here is called post-training quantization. It means that our model was already trained um, in Python, for example, or TensorFlow in floating mm -hmm. point precision. And then we take that pre-trained model or trained if we don't doing uh, fine tuning. Uh, use our use uh, the representative data set, sometimes called calibration data set, and we quantize that model to int eight format. So it means all our weights and all our operations will happen now in int eight precision, and that's all, mm -hmm. right? So we need to provide yeah. two things: model plus calibration data set. And so the, the calibration, this is, I've always wondered this. So does the calibration data set need to be exactly the same as it was trained on? Like if you just use the reference Coco data set, is that close enough? Or, or do you really need like a domain specific data set? Like if you do medical imagery, you need a medical imagery post training calibration. So in most cases, we should use the same domain as training data set. Of course, it's better to use, for example, validation data set yeah. instead of training one, right? Because training was already used for training. So it's like, a, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit dirty, I would say. Like, you know, you shouldn't use training yeah. for anything else than training, right? So right. that's yeah. why. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. So okay. I propose here uh, to use um, validation data set for quantization. That, that's a, yeah. that's that a good sense. idea. Yeah. And, and how many, like, I think in, when we were talking before, you said, I think at least 500 pictures is kind of, like a minimum sweet spot to, to really get the benefits? So our research says that about 300 is okay. Uh, I know that yeah, in yeah. case of Yolo V8, we use 128 because that data set <laughs> yeah, we have, have that Coco 128 data set. It's really handy. Yes, exactly. Maybe That's we why, but... 300 then. 
Uh, yeah, of course. But it looks <laughs> yeah, like 120, 28 is absolutely enough, right? We tested with that yeah. and it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, if we would like to do the decomposition ourselves in OpenVINO plus NNCF, it must look like this. So, we import OpenVINO, we import NNCF, and NNCF means neural, uh, neural network compression framework, and it's part of OpenVINO, but this is a separate package. So, part of yes, our but you, you know, full you story. Get when you pip install OpenVINO, right? Yes, like yes, yes. We do the same. Pip install OpenVINO and pip install NNCF. And in NNCF, we okay. can do many, we can use many compression algorithms like post training quantization, post training, uh, sorry, accuracy aware quantization, uh, quantization aware yeah. train, also weight quantization, many, many of them. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's different ways to, to take those continuous values and discretize them. Yeah. And right now, in Alteralytics, we use just post-training quantization. That's, so that's why I just um, explained what post-training quantization is. And in this case, we, of course, we need to load our model. Then we need to get our data. This is the, our representative calibration data set. Then we define a function of transformation. So how to pre-process input to feed our neural network during quantization. Uh, yeah. We create in specific um, format like and then CF data set, and then we do the quantization providing model mm. calibration data set plus optional preset. And that's done. And the, uh, let's see here. So the, what's happening when you do this is that you're taking a look at essentially the, I guess the dynamic range or the distribution of values, say like per tensor or per channel, uh, based on the calibration data set. So for example, if you see like all the values range from say like negative 10 to 10, then you know you can just kind of like spread your 128 or 256 values between those two extremes, right? That's exactly how it works, Glenn. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is that so then you must have like a table, say like per per layer or per module or per per, per layer. Channel. Yeah, position is on per, <laughs> per layer. layer. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. So if Yolo VN has like say like 20 or 30 layers, then you got like 20 or 30 tables with the different extremes. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Because yeah, I guess that does make sense. Because I guess as you go down the model, the uh, the dynamic range of the values you see there for those features is probably going to differ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And okay. as we change the precision flow from thing point to end eight, we should expect a little accuracy drop, right? We are changing mm -hmm. precision. We are losing some some values, something like that. But mm -hmm. fortunately. In most cases I have seen in my life, it was less than 1% of accuracy I was losing. And in case of Yolo V8, look at this. We are losing like 0 0.006. It's, it's, it's yeah, like neg yeah. negligible at all, right? And it still works. So right now we this have really smaller good, model yeah. size. Like this is the kind of difference you wouldn't really notice just with it visually by looking at two examples. Exactly. But you would so see the speed difference. Faster inference and this almost the same accuracy. I would say this is like a free lunch, right? You just need to run a one command line, something like that. Yeah. So you get a lot of benefit and not too much cost. Exactly. In in this specific case, of course, there are some models which are very, very difficult to quantize. For example, they lose like 20% <laughs> really of, of accuracy. But this is not the case here, right? YOLO V8 is yeah. very, very easy to quantize. So, uh, Glenn, what we did uh, in the package, we implemented all the code I showed here, so the quantization yeah. code into our into yours export function. And what else, Glenn? Could you show us more? Tell yeah. us more. Yeah. So this is this is like super easy to access. So uh, to get in date precision for your exported OpenVINO models. You just pass the int8 argument. You just set that to true. Uh, and the same thing with half, actually. So half is going to turn that into FP16. And then once those models are loaded for inference, you don't have to do anything. Like it'll automatically know the precision and then convert the input appropriately. Which got me thinking. So Adrian, the demo you were showing earlier, I think that was with just a full FP32 model, right? That didn't include any benefits from quantization here. That's 
That's correct. So I have another demo yeah. for you, of course, oh, running perfect. monetization. Okay, <laughs> so let's nice. share my uh, command line again, and let's try quantization this time. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, I think I am there. Yes. OK, so let's first quantize our model. So we need to run the YOLO export model, uh, mm -hmm. YOLO export function once again. Now we are adding additional argument at the end, int 8. Mm -hmm. So it means our model will be quantized. Of course, it will be a little bit slower than just a simple export, right? Because we need to take all these data from Coco 128 and quantize the model. Mm -hmm. So you can see progress bar, for example, here. Yeah, perfect. So this is using that Coco 128 data set we talked about. And if you don't have it right click, it'll just automatically install itself. And it's done. Look at this. It was super fast, right? And we can yeah, see cool. the, mo well, the, model's the model really small, is here. 3.6 megabytes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So okay. let's try to run our int 8 um, precision. So in latency mm -hmm. mode uh, at the mm -hmm. right now, right? So you remember 21 uh, milliseconds per PyTorch um, floating point inference. OpenVINO was 4.1 milliseconds. And let's run mm -hmm. uh, right now the quantize, quantize model and see what uh, inference time we have. Okay. Z, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 5.4, uh, right? yes. Okay. So <laughs> it was slower yeah. again. <laughs> what, what is the, <laughs> surprising? The first demo is really good. <laughs> the, the, the first live <laughs> demo is the best. <laughs> no idea what happened then. Um, it was beginners let's month, run once again the, <laughs> the floating point model because it, this is just unbelievable. Yeah, this is the Maybe original I'm one. So let's see. Reading the wrong value or something like that. I don't know what happened. You know, sometimes sometimes when I see different performance on accelerated hardware, I think I think it's due to heat sometimes. But actually, no. Um, so in this case, okay, three point nine. So that's yes, yeah, so the very first one's the fastest one. It got even faster. Ah. Uh, it's getting faster. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I know the reason. Um, in case of um, yeah. quantized model, we probably use CPU, right? Because CPU is um, optimized for running integer operations. Oh. In case of oh, okay. um, floating point, we use GPU. And mm -hmm. that's why it's super fast, because GPU is super fast device, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that's why it looks like this. But let's do our a combination, right? So let's run um, our quantized model with batch size equals 288. And let's see the results right now. I hope it will be the fastest, okay. right? If not, I, I, am, <laughs> I am done. <laughs> you know? Now we're going to have to do this, this live session all over again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see here. OK, so it says cumulative throughput mode. It's got the right batch size, 288. And you're on Twitch. And guys, you at least know so 4.0, okay. uh, 4.1. Okay. So it's faster than okay. um, floating part mode, but uh, similar time to to not uh, throughput mode, to latency mode, right? Because, um, yeah, 4.1, 3.9, it's very, very similar time. Yeah, I'd say so. You know, like as, as you get down to the like the single millisecond time per image, I think. I think other considerations kind of start to kick in also, uh, like things that may not be accelerated, just like the data loading, the pre-processing, the post-processing, things like that. So, Yes, that, that could be true, of course. But I think the, the speed up from just the general torch on CPU is pretty incredible. So, so this could be basically like a deployment endpoint. You, uh, you yeah. get the response back in four milliseconds. It's you know, insanely fast. That's super cool. Glenn, I also, uh, you remember, we benchmark some OpenVINO uh, models. Could you show the, uh, us that? Um, it's in Ultralytics documentation, yeah. right? Yeah, let me so see. It, let me see if I can, uh, OK, I'm going to try and share my screen here. So let me try this. OK. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you guys would like to see the difference between PyTorch, OpenVINO, everything like that, we do did the benchmarks for you a half a year ago, and they are there in the documentation, so you can easily um, okay. go there and, and look. 
Let's see. Okay, so I should be sharing my browser here. Let's see. Are you guys seeing this? It looks like no. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Well, I don't see myself sharing anything just yet. Maybe I'll I'll drop a link here though, because we made a really yeah. cool docs page with uh, a lot of really cool benchmarks. So we worked on uh, benchmarking open Vino models uh, against PyTorch in a number of other formats. So let's see here. And that is in our docs at docs.ultralytics.com slash integrations slash open Vino. Let's see here. Okay. Cool. Let me paste that. Oh, actually, yeah, I will. I'm not signed into the chat, but if, okay, there we go. Okay, so we pasted it right here in the YouTube page, and there it is. But uh, let's see, I only see myself. Hmm. I don't know what is going on here. Guys, I'm not sure. It looks like I'm just by myself here. Uh, okay. Okay. I just see myself. This is no bueno. Huh. Oh, oh, I am back. I'm yeah. back. I thought, was I gone or were you gone? <laughs> hey, maybe we were both gone. <laughs> okay, okay, anyway, so let's see. It looks like there's a bunch of questions we've got here let's on YouTube. See, let's Glenn, get to these. If we can uh, share my screen. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you share your screen in the meantime? I will go take a look through these questions and uh, pull up the most interesting ones. So, so let's see here. We've got, all right, let's see. So Jason Daniel is asking this. He said, uh, Is all of this going to work on the new Intel GPUs? Yes, yes, that's the idea. It will, of course. Is there a specific export that's needed like for Onyx? Uh, and the answer is no. So, so that's right. So with Onyx, you have to kind of like define where you want to send it and you have to install the right package, uh, like whether it's for GP or CPU. But here, just that single open Vino package just handles everything, which is really nice. It makes your life simple. All right. And then let's see, we've got Toreb Shaikh. He says, what do we need to install to use open Vino? Do we need to install a bunch of stuff for CUDA? And also, will this work on integrated GPU? What do you so think, Adrian? <laughs> we don't have to install any CUDA because we don't use CUDA. We just use our OpenVINO, and that's enough. So we just need to install OpenVINO. And of course, it will work on integrated GPU as well, no problem. And I think, Glenn, if you export to OpenVINO and you don't have OpenVINO installed, it will be installed automatically, right? Actually, that's right. Yeah, you, you don't even need to install OpenVINO because it'll it'll be installed for you when you run the export if you don't have it. Uh, or if your version's out of date, it'll bring it up to speed. And even on the inference side, like if someone gives you an OpenVINO model and you want to run inference with it, then we'll just automatically get that installed for you if it's missing. So we try and uh, make your life as easy as possible here. Oh, yeah, cool. We got the screenshot here. All right, so this is the docs page we were talking about. So if you go to docs.ultralytics.com, uh, in the integration section, you can see this. So these are really cool benchmarks we did with Torch, uh, OpenVINO, Onyx. And you can see that uh, on, on these Intel GPUs, the performance is really impressive. So, so the OpenVINO yeah, model is Yeah, this is, is the really same GPU uh, I showed here, uh, today, right? This is the same GPU. And this is, let's see, so Flex is for consumer applications, right? And there's another type of GPU called Arc. It's for it's for server. Flex is for, for servers. And if you oh, would like to look design. at um, consumer, it's Arc here. Well, wow, the difference is even, it's even bigger here. So there's a, there's a little yeah. yellow bar here, guys, like on each one of these. And that's the open Vino time on these Arc GPUs. And this is for all the different size models that we have here. So it looks like the bigger your model is, the faster the time difference. So the, the Yolo V8X difference is, uh, is very impressive. So, And that's even stacked up here against Onyx also. So 
Yeah, and of course and we then, tested uh, Xeon CPU. Mm -hmm. That's the next one here. And then and lastly, the core CPUs. Core. Yes. Yeah. Which is oh, already... I did this one. Yeah. yeah. This is this is the one I I wrote a little script here, did some benchmarking, created the plots and all that. But yeah, just I went down to the store and bought a laptop for this. So this is all run on a laptop. It's uh, but it's a I think it was like one of the yeah right there Core i seven, so it's uh, thirteen yes. gen hardware with integrated GPU. That's why it yeah yeah integrated like GPU. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, there's nothing special about that. It's not like a gaming laptop or anything like that. It's just a. Uh, just a regular 13th gen laptop that I picked up to get these results here. So Windows laptop. Oh, but uh, here, back to the questions. So let's yeah. see here. Let me scroll down a little more. Okay, so we got, let's see, Ronald Pandolfi. He says, is this going to be useful for integrating inference on audio and video streams, not just for machine vision? Um, okay, so inference yes. on audio and inference on video, yeah. No problem, because as I mentioned, OpenVINO was created as visual inference, but right now it supports any, everything, absolutely. Language, audio, um, gen AI, large language models, transformers, everything like that is supported, so it will work. Okay. Let's see, we have a request to test on a real-time feed from Great Saramond. He says, can you test with a real feed? on like a webcam or showcase the desk with a pre-trained yellow VAS model. So I don't think we didn't get to it today, but you can do that really simply. Um, if you just, from the CLI, you can run yellow predict source equals zero. And the zero just indicates the uh, index for your streaming uh, hardware. So webcam will just always be index zero. So source equals zero and then model equals that open Vino model. And then, yeah, and you can, you can definitely, definitely see the speed difference that way. It's pretty clear. And then let's see, Mr. Smith, okay, like the movie, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He says, I wanted to know how many epochs you're needed to get good accuracy with the yellow model. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a bit of an open-ended question, and um, it depends on a lot of factors, so it's impossible to answer without additional information. But uh, the rule of thumb here is you should train until your validation loss begins to uh, increase. And so this will be overfitting. If, you're, if your loss plot looks like this, and at the end, you have like minimum loss, you haven't trained long enough. So if you train that model for like 100 epochs, go back and train it for 300. And like what you want to see is a loss curve that looks like this. It starts to come up at the end. And then you've really guaranteed that uh, you're really overfitting on your data set and you've gotten the most that you can out of the training. So you don't want to overfit too much though, but uh, just a little bit at the end kind of guarantees you that you did enough. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Oh, Andres Camacho. He says, which versions of Python are supported for exporting YOLO V8 models to OpenVINO? Oh, okay. So we, we run CI on all Python versions from 3.8 all the way up to, well, I don't, I don't know about 3.12. 3.11, definitely. No, no. Uh, we don't support 3.12 okay. for now. And this is okay. super difficult because we would like to support it. However, our de dependencies don't support hey, the 3.12, that's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying to introduce support for it. We have a couple of users that have submitted PRs, and I'd, I'd love to get that in, too. I think Torch itself just recently introduced 3.12 support. Yeah. But for us, like, we have a few export dependencies that are lacking it. So, okay, so let's see here. So stay tuned, 3.12 at some point in the future, but for now, 3.8 to 3.11. Correct. All right, now uh, let's see here. Cyberhard says the speed increases, but does this come at a cost in accuracy? Oh yeah, yeah, so absolutely. This is that slide that we saw there. So as you discretize to end date, you'll lose something like half a percent, 1% math, but your speed, I think for the most part, and the size of the model reducing will definitely be worth the trade off. And then here we go, Mr. Smith is back at it. He's got a few questions. He says, can I run two differently trained models on YOLO V8 simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, you can load two models into the workspace at the same time. Uh, there's a right way to do that, though, so that they don't conflict with each other, uh, especially if you want to run them in separate threads. And so there's a, there's like a threaded inference guide right there in the docs. If you search the uh, little search bar for it, you'll be able to find that. Uh, and the reason that you need to do it the right way is that um, for threaded inference, especially, uh, some of the modules will conflict 
if uh, if it's not handled properly. And I think the right way to handle it properly is to initiate the model into thread. If you initiate two models outside and pass them into the two threads, then they're going to start to mix and match and have problems. Okay, so then uh, let's see here. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, and Cyberheart said the same answer. He says there's no magic answer to how many epochs, but it's true. You have to experiment a bit. But that's the fun part, right? Like a lot of ML is really about discovering things and experimenting. It's what in physics they call an empirical science, which means that the answer is just based on the answer you get from experimenting. It's it's hard to predict an answer or come up with a theory that defines an answer. You really just have to do trial and error. Okay, and then oh, here Nikolai, Nikolai Nielsen. So Nikolai's got our uh, amazing YouTube series. He's he's creating a lot of awesome demos and YouTube videos. He says, create a custom Python script, a few lines of code, but you'll need to create two model instances. Oh, he's answering the, the two model answer. Yep. All right, and then let's see here. So, well, okay, we got a lot of questions. Let me, uh, let's see here. Okay. Okay, we got a few. Do, do, do. Wow, okay, a lot of people are posting a lot of stuff. Okay, here we got Bella Lastry, and she says, Intel had ambitious projects in the past, like, Xeon Phi, but then the project was terminated. Does it make sense to invest money into buying some new NPUs? Mm, what do you think, Adrian? So uh, I don't think NPU project will be mm, like deprecated or anything like that. I have already a laptop with NPU um, device. It works well, and I think this is future, right? We cannot use CPU, GPUs for all inference. Of course, for some inference, it's okay. But if we um, have we have a heavy load for our CPU, we cannot use it for anything else. So absolutely, I don't think NPU will be um, deprecated soon or anything like that. I don't believe that. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And then here we got a pretty technical question that I don't entirely understand, but I, I think you might, Adrian. So this is from Damas Vinci. He says, is it possible to capitalize on OpenVINO without AVX2 VNNI. Do you know what that means? So um, the question is, is instruction it, uh, sets, right? Yes, yes, so they says, are. He says, is it possible to capitalize on OpenVINO without having AVX2? Uh, and then something called like okay. VNNI mm -hmm. installed. OK, I think I understand the question. So of course, if you have AVX, if you have VNNI and other specific instructions, it will be faster, right? I cannot say right now that um, not having them means uh, it's not worth to try. I would try it and see, right? Uh, in most cases, it depends on first model architecture, then the hardware you have, right? So uh, even if you don't have AVX or a VNNI, I would try and see. Uh, in most cases, especially as you can see here, Yolo V8 is very, uh, the, the performance of Yolo V8 in OpenVINO is very nice. So even if you don't have them, I think it, it's worth to try and, and see. Maybe it's faster, 20%, maybe 50, uh, but it should be faster. Hmm. Okay. Okay, interesting. And then we've got a really good question here from Hammer. He says, any plans to support training for Ultralytics with OpenVINO on Intel Arc? So I guess this is, this is a great question. This goes beyond Ultralytics. This is more about the training frameworks like Torch and TensorFlow. Correct. OpenVINO is not a training um, framework, so there won't be training for now. There is no plans to implement anything like that. OpenVINO is for inference only. What about just, uh, I guess, if you take the OpenVINO out of the equation, Intel Arc support for training frameworks. Do you think that's something that so, might roll out in the future? Yeah, so for now, um, if you would like to use Intel Arc or any other Intel hardware, you still need to use PyTorch or TensorFlow. So as I said, no plans okay. to support training in OpenVINO for now. Yeah, OK, OK. OK, all right, guys. And then uh, let's see, last thing. Not a question, but a comment. It says uh, from Bella again, thanks for answering. I love Ultralytics. And uh, Ultralytics loves you too. And so I think that's it. We're <laughs> right on time here, guys. So uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. If we didn't get to your question, I apologize, but please just drop it in uh, one of the Ultralytics uh, or Intel OpenVINO GitHub repos as an issue, and we'll get to it there. So everybody have a, an amazing rest of your week, and thank you for joining. And thank you, Adrian, yes. for explaining all of this to us. Yeah.
Thanks, Glenn, for having me here. And if you have any questions after that uh, webinar, please find me at LinkedIn, Adrian Boguszewski, Intel, Warsaw, Poland, and I will answer those questions there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.